Kyle, welcome to the Lifestyles Podcast, dude. Fuck yeah, thanks for having me, brother. It's funny doing two back-to-back shows, like so close without even going outside and kind of rebooting. I'm like, wait, who's interviewing who? So those of you listening, Kyle Kingsbury here just interviewed me for the On It podcast. So I don't know which one's going to come out first, but we just did an hour deep dive into some crazy ass shit. It's going to take a little minute. Good, yeah, mine too. Yeah, we're going to probably be, I'm looking at July. Yeah, mine could be even longer, I know. Isn't that crazy when you have a podcast though? It's like, there's such an abundance of fascinating people to interview that I never want to pass one up. Like, I don't need any interviews right now, but there were two really dope people I ran into at Paleo FX, and I'm just like... That's what I like, though. I'm like, fuck, I got to do it. I, I can't like miss this. Yeah, when you're, if your back's against the wall, it sucks, you know? But once, yeah. you, once you're ahead of the curve, then it's just like, hey, man, there's these fucking awesome people to podcast with, and sorry, your podcast won't air for three months, but that's the name of the game. You I've, know, I've that spot. I've had a couple... You know, we were talking about Max Lugavere, mm-hmm. and he, he came over and did, did my show, and I, I don't think I realized he had a book launch happening, and so he texted me. He's like, hey, my book comes out. Is the show out this week? And I was like, shit, did I tell him it was coming out this week? I don't even know when <laughs> they're coming out. And then luckily, he hit the New York Times bestseller list anyway without my little podcast helping. But yeah, it's, um, it is a little weird when you sit on one for a while, and you know, I think people are probably like, is he ever going to put it out? But you know, you got to sequence. To me, I sequence the shows according to sort of the message. So if I do one on fitness, I'm not going to do two of those in a row. Yeah, I've never run back to back fighters. You know, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. MMA guys on two weeks in a row. That's fucking exactly. Just, yeah, it's all bad. So why I'm excited to talk to you is you're a little bit. I mean, now that I get got to know you in our other interview, we're totally on the same page with a zillion things, but you are a little bit unique because I haven't interviewed definitely no one that is like warrior energy that's been an MMA fighter and has done some of the crazy shit that you've done to other people and to yourself, which has always been fascinating to me because I've been in two fights my whole life. And I was like, I think one, I was probably seven years old and the other one, 12, both times I got a couple of hits in and then they got me on the ground and I was like, uncle, you know, and my like, Kids I sold weed to pulled them off of me, and that was the end of the <laughs> fight. You know? uh, so we'll get into some of that. But uh, you know, I've been studying up on you and listening to your show and stuff like that. And we have so much in common in our past. Uh, in a sense, we've manifested you know our our adult lives a little bit differently in many ways. But something I really identified with you was some of the shit that you felt in childhood. And so I want to take you back in a time machine a little bit and give us a little bit of context of your journey and some of that discomfort you felt early on some of the trauma as you experienced it that led you to be this fucking beacon of health and personal development and consciousness exploration fitness exploration i mean you're a really well-rounded dude but i know a little bit about you now and that pain is what kind of motivated you in the beginning yeah i think you know it's even in, in health and wellness uh i don't like to label shit you know obviously as you do the work you're like oh that fucking puts you in a box that's no good right and all these guys that i look up to in that field like rob wolf and mark sisson and many others th- the same goes for them they're more than their fucking work they're more than the books they write you know but i mean i think pain's the catalyst for all of them rob wolf talked about being a raw vegan for a couple of oh, years he was? In college. I didn't know that. yeah man and that oh, was wow. the catalyst his health went in the shitter you know, and that's when he really started diving in and became an apprentice under Lauren Cordain and, and started figuring out paleo. And now he's known as a paleo guy, but he's still, you know, he'll eat fucking corn, corn tortilla tacos and shit like that, you know, and he's not too dogmatic about his approach. And I appreciate that. But that's yeah, that's good because I ate those last night here in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that thing. Pain, pain is, <laughs> we have fucking, you know, good cheeses from Southern European cows, you know, like I'm not diehard paleo I'm, yeah. and I'm only keto part of the year um i think those are good practices fasting you know we can dive into that too obviously yeah. but yeah pain pain most definitely was a catalyst and it's funny how it it came to where i am now because you know you talk about the arc of the hero's journey and you certainly have a fucking big arc you know but like it's it's this idea like i mean just to paint the picture and i, I said this on the solo podcast on the on it show everyone goes through shit you know and that's that that is my 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 disclaimer it's not a woe is me story it's not uh i had it worse than anyone else everyone goes through shit and the thing is you know i think the thing that fucked me up the most was seeing my parents fight constantly constantly you know physically or verbal uh almost always verbally you know they would throw shit so there was some physical stuff but then you know my dad never beat us or beat beat my my mom or anything like that 
Um, cops were called a number of times, things like that. But it's that level of discord and, you know, screaming in each other's faces and screaming in my face. And, and, uh, I fought a lot growing up, you know, like that was a release for me. You, you know, you listen to guys yeah. like Steven Kotler and, and, uh, Jamie wheel talk about flow states. Yeah. That's the fucking flow state. I wasn't thinking about anything going on at home. And there was a part of me that because of this stuff I was going through, I really enjoyed fucking people up and yeah. I didn't care if I got yeah. punched in the face because I felt alive. I felt in the moment and present and I didn't have any other worries. It was just, I'm in survival mode and it feels really good to be here. That's funny. I can kind of connect to that. Although, as I said, I don't have that same experience, but I'm feeling you out right there. And it's like, I'm seeing you in those fights, not only releasing some of the pain that you were accumulating and pushing it out, expressing, pressing out that pain, but I can see you in that flow state, in that presence. Like I can imagine when someone's trying to fucking kill you, that you have to be present. <laughs> like all your problems and the shit going on at home disappears because you're like, ha ha ha. I'm in with this guy. Mm -hmm. It's after school or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. on the fucking field or wherever fights happen when you're younger, you know? Yeah, and it wasn't, and that's the thing, like Bruce Lee would say, you know, don't fight angry, you know, be present. It narrows your vision, right? Right. And that's something you really, a lot of, all the best fighters in professional fighting embody that, you know, but there is an emotional aspect to it. And I think in those fights when I was a kid, I never fought angry. There was just this like, oh yes, like, yes, we're going to do this, you know, like fear, for certain but the second the first punch is thrown it's just fuck yeah we're in it you know and then it's just no thought just pure silence pure pure movement wow. pure pure embodiment of 100 percent presence and aggression like i'm gonna fuck it i can it's an outlet it's the greatest outlet and it was a beautiful outlet for me but that was you know it's funny when i look back and kind of unpack that the motivation behind that and really seeing and even when i first started fighting professionally that was still there. I very much wanted to fucking destroy people. It wasn't about being the best version of myself, which, you know, when I retired, that was what it had become. Right. But certainly when I first got into it, it was like, I want to fuck people up, you know? Was there, you know, we're going to, I'm going to have to be non-linear here because I, I got the clock here and I got to catch a plane. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to fuck with your story you right now. All around. Well, brother. there's too many interesting things in there. Um, when, when you're fighting like that, is there camaraderie between the fighters is there on the professional level yeah yeah you okay know, most i'm not guys, talking about school yeah, scuffles most, and shit most guys that make it to that level um they respect the game they know they're that everyone's trying to fuck only one guy can hold the belt you know what i'm saying sure. everyone's working towards the same shit yeah um there's quite a few guys that i become really close with even guys that have lost to you know after right. after fights but when you're in the ring you're still like i'm gonna kill this motherfucker yeah for the sport of it yeah for the okay. sport and, right. and because we've both signed the documents a contract to do this thing and when the cage door shuts all that shit's out the window whatever whatever was said before whatever the predictions are whatever the media is talking about that has nothing to do with it it's your asses on the line and the only way out is to fucking successfully defend yourself and to right. win right Bloody or shit. get the shit beat out of you which i've i've been the nail as just as many times i've been the hammer or close to it you yeah know? yeah it's just funny i can't wait to get into more of that but let's let's get back to your story so so that was your first kind of expression or coping mechanism and mm -hmm. then as i recall you also started getting into some drugs and drinking and partying a bit as an escape as well yeah football was a big outlet for me prior to that you know and my parents i don't know if it was a good job but they would always tell me you know don't do drugs it'll ruin your testosterone and ruin your performance and that was a great that was a great play <laughs> is for my that true? dad. Yeah. You know, he was I wonder if that's actually true. Well, I think he alcohol was just... is going to fuck with a lot of stuff, right. you know, and certainly with sleep. That's that's a given. There's science. It's smart there. of your that dad, though. If he's like, all right, what's his passion? Uh -huh. And let me tell him the drugs are going to fuck with his passion. Yeah, it was a great angle. Great yeah. angle. Um, and those are the wrong drugs. You know, I'm, I'm an advocate for the right drugs. Yeah. Uh, as, as the McKenna brothers have said, we're walking bags of chemicals. You know, I mean, fucking, you could argue nootropics are drugs. Caffeine yeah. is a drug nicotine is a drug you know i'm with you i'm with you too as someone yeah. that you know doesn't at this point choose to like recreationally do drugs but i mean the the coca plant the morphine poppy they have a place in in our human uh, evolution yeah and they have uses like if if i fucking get hit by a car walking out of here today knock on wood you better give my ass some morphine <laughs> you know yeah but i'm not going to go to find the ghetto in austin and go buy it and try to put it in myself because i have emotional pain i'm trying to mask you know so yeah. i i like that perspective there is a right drugs. way and a wrong way to do anything yeah you know yeah and but it's I, taken 
a long time to figure that out. <laughs> there are the drugs too that elevate your consciousness. And then there are the ones that if you touch them enough, they're going to bring your ass way down. Yeah. So alcohol you, ultimately is that it's the anti-psychedelic, you know, it's, it's right. numbing. It, it takes you down a notch and it, a lot of people think it's freeing. I'm a best self. I'm this, I'm that. But what you're doing is you're essentially quieting the noise and there's other ways to do that that are less detrimental. Yeah. You know, and I still drink on occasion, but nowhere near the way that I used to drink when, you know, and it's funny because I could never see my, my, uh, I have, <laughs> I almost slipped up. We would have needed some editing. I have close family <laughs> members that have gone through AA and the 12 steps. And right. that, that does resonate with me. I've been, um, I've been in many meetings, you know, and in those things, you know, there, there's a lot of commonalities with that, but it's this general idea of, you know, they have ideas like, yeah, you know, you're going to drink to cover things. You're going to drink when you're in pain. You're going to drink that way. And I never saw that in myself. I saw, I'm drinking a party. I'm drinking to have a good time. Yeah. But I yeah. just kept pouring fucking gasoline on the fire. You know, like there was no limit. I have memories of, uh, you know, <laughs> flashbacks of being like 13 years old, 14 years old in my fucking chonies, hanging out over my mom's balcony in the backyard, just projectile vomiting everywhere. I remember those it. days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and, it, and it's funny to look back on that because it never, even in college, was a thing where I'm drinking because I'm in pain. I'm just drinking to have a good time, you know? And And I saw... The relationship that I had with alcohol and with any drug for that matter was to escape. It was because I was not comfortable in my own skin. You yeah, know, truly. Yeah. And then what about the other stuff that you've talked about? And and one thing I think is really cool about you, and I'd love for people to go back and listen to that episode, the solo show you did on the On It podcast. It was in December mm -hmm. 2017. Uh and you like break down and start getting choked up in that episode. And I've done that a bunch of times on my podcast. And there's like the ego side of me is embarrassed as shit. I feel like such a fucking wuss for doing that. But I'm also like pretty out there, like woo woo hippie kind of trippy fucking guy. So it's not that unexpected. I really respected the fact that you were able to connect like that because you're a big dude. You're a fitness guy, former MMA guy. Like I wouldn't look at you and be like, oh, there's a guy who's in touch with his feelings. And can access <laughs> his trauma and like use feminine energy and shit. It's just like, no. But I like that you were able to access that and be that authentic and vulnerable, man. And I just want to commend you for being that real because as a man, you know, even though I wasn't like your archetypical tough guy, I was a musician and creative and more artistic and stuff like that. It was never safe to talk about shit like we're talking about now. It's mm -hmm. so cool and healthy that men like us from all walks of life and you know i'm a little bit older than you by 10 years or so are able to really i think inspire this next generation of men by going there and talking about some of this stuff so what i'd like to hear about from you that i so related to was not only the escapism that you use through violence and drugs and alcohol but the suicidal ideation and the point that you got to where it almost became more than an idea yeah uh so probably i mean for certain, I recall having thoughts of how I was going to kill myself, like planning suicide at seven years old. Maybe it started at six, but definitely by seven. And I remember, you know, thinking of which rifle I could use out of my dad's closet, but the fact that my fingers wouldn't reach far enough to get the gun pointed at my head, um, all sorts of shit. I, you can I, use a stick for that, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now you're not to be morbid. I'm glad you didn't figure that out, but just saying. Uh, probably a toe could have worked, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's really fucked up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, we're, on the, we're on the other side of yeah, it. Yeah, brother, you know? we're on the other side, man. Yeah. It's, it's a water under the bridge. And uh, I remember asking my dad um, what would happen if I jumped off of our uh, patio onto the ground head first, if I swan dove. And it was only a you know, second story. And he's like, well, you wouldn't die. You'd probably break, you know, your your neck and, and a lot of vertebrae, and it, you'd be fucked up. You might be paralyzed. You might have all this shit. And, and I was nodding my head and listening, but I had already heard the answer I wanted to hear. I wouldn't die, right? So I knew that one was out. And but this was the shit. Like when he when I asked him that question, I don't think he had any idea. That's what I was trying to get to, you know. And um, I started, you know, therapy at a young age, and I thought it was beneficial in a certain sense you know when, when it came to why is he fucking up in school why can't he learn um it's like no no he's you know i i was told i was very intelligent and i just didn't like the work and things like that and clearly now i can see that was the case but um yeah suicidal thoughts came and went and and um 
you know, I tried to run away with my sister, didn't make it far. My parents followed us, you know, they, they were like, okay, you guys can run away, you know, and, and we're not coming home, you know, and then they're like a hundred yards behind us the whole time on our walk. And then we were like, fuck, where are we going to sleep? All right, let's turn back. Yeah, you have like your five dollar allowance in your pocket. <laughs> Two dollars a week. Yeah. Two dollars a week. Like, cool. We can get a happy same. meal and then by around eight o'clock we're gonna be starving and cold. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, I think in college, that's where I started getting into pills. And um, you know, I had a doctor that would give me anything, Valium, Vicodin, Xanax. Sweet. And so when you have anxiety because you can't sit in your own skin comfortably, um, it's a great, it's a great way to mask that. It's a phenomenal way. But when you stop taking those things, that fucking rebound is real. Like if you've been yeah. chemically altering your anxiety for a period of time and you decide, hey, I feel good. I'm not going to take it. That anxiety is right in your fucking face because you've solved nothing. You have unpacked none of the trauma. <laughs> it's still right fucking there. So well said. Just underneath the surface, you know? And also and, when you're being an armchair, like self-administrative or administrating doctor will do things like, take cocaine and crystal meth to treat anxiety uh bad idea we'll take alcohol to treat depression it's a fucking depressant mm -hmm. you yeah know? So. yeah yeah and then the doctor is not even considering coke and alcohol as a part of the equation right it's like valium was great to come down from coke you know and xanax was great when the coke was really strong you know those kind of things so it's like you're doing this fucking roller coaster with your neurochemistry and no telling what it's how it's bogging down the liver and the kidneys and all that and still escaping the pain not not addressing it you know and and uh foot, when football ended in college i sat the bench you know my junior senior year at asu and that was it left a chip on my shoulder which kind of fueled the fighting but um when you say you're on the bench they're not putting you in the games yeah i would get in for like two or three plays and it oh. fucking drove me crazy. And then that, that's not because I was the best guy. That, it's because I just wanted to fucking play. Yeah. I'd been I had been the best guy until I got to ASU. Uh, you know? And and uh I'm not the guys that started, some of them didn't even go pro, but they definitely were better than I was looking back on it. Right. Um but when it ended, I had all that's all I knew was being an athlete my entire life. And I lost that camaraderie. I lost a reason. To want to do shit i knew i didn't want a desk job which i have now i didn't want to sit in a fucking cubicle i didn't want to do sales or any of the shit that my parents did and um having lost all that and then finally all this shit's in my face again you know the childhood stuff everything that's going on that i'd never addressed i went really into probably the deepest depression that i'd ever had and um with you know the the fucking gauntlet of chemicals that i'm putting into my body uh, a lot of them pharmaceutical that have been prescribed like it just was a fucking recipe for rock bottom you know and and um some shit had happened in a, in a relationship that i was in early on where i just realized like i thought no one will ever love me yeah i know that feeling bro <laughs> man I don't even think I brought that up on the solo cast, but that, yeah, there it still is. Still fucking, still there. Yeah, and that was so so hard and difficult that it was like, all right, fuck it. I've got whatever pills I got left in the container. They're going down the hatch, and I knew that probably wasn't enough. I went at sixty pills of fucking the two milligrams anti bars, like really ridiculous strength shit. But I only had maybe 10 or 12 left and I only had 10 or 20 left Viking and so or Valium. So I tossed it all down the hatch and I drove to the Taka, top of parking lot seven at ASU to jump off, stripped down naked. And the security guard saw me going up there in the middle of the night. And he was like, what the fuck is this drunk guy doing? You know, I probably was driving like a madman. And um, right as that stuff kicking in, it actually it might have worked in some way to calm the anxiety. But I, that was the first time where I really felt I'm not alone. Like, I don't have to do this alone. Like, there was some sense of there's more in life. There, whatever consciousness is, whatever guiding light, God, whatever great spirit there is, like, I felt loved, you know? And this guy fucking caught up to me and he was like, hey, oh, you're naked. Uh, duh, what are you doing? Can you come down right now? And I was like, yeah, man, I'll come down. And uh, kind of woke up in a, in a hospital a day or two later snap didn't remember anything you know my, my parents had flown out and my sister and they're like uh 
like, why are the fucking nurses such assholes here? And they're like, you were not nice to them. Oh, <laughs> I was like, okay, man. all right, that makes sense. But, um, you know, and I've, I've, you know, yeah, I had to let go of that. But uh, I spent some time in, in what my mom calls a loony bin. I think it was like a transitionary place for people to detox and whatnot. And in that, it was funny because everyone there, had their own issues and they're looking at me like you're fucking a 240 pound good looking football player that goes to college and your your family's here like what the fuck do you have that's going wrong like seriously like take a look in the mirror and i'm like it has nothing to do with that it really doesn't it had everything to do with me not doing the work and me not being comfortable in the world you know and that having that break it was necessary it was a huge component you know and then of course they wanted to put me on ssris and all the the neurochemistry shit and hey you got bipolar disorder and lithium was the first you know mental drug that i took where i realized i'm not going to take any of this stuff because it turned me into a fucking mute i didn't feel highs or lows i just felt nothing and i felt I like a zombie that. floating yeah. through space yeah and, and that might have been dose dependent or not but it, the point is like i realized right there like whatever needs to be done needs to be done internally i'm not going to fix it with a pill and um, that was a huge catalyst for me. And then not long after that, I got into fighting and there was my outlet. I hadn't done the work per se, but I had a new outlet. I had a team. I had something that was bigger than me that I could work towards. And I was really good at it. You know, my first two fights, I won in under 30 seconds. So it was Damn. like, there was a fucking draw, you know, yeah. like, hey, I can be really good at something. And the goal of making it in the UFC, I'd watched, you know, since I was a kid. Um, and along the way, I had a, uh, a boxing coach who was part native american who would take me for traditional sweat lodges before and after every fight camp oh no way you know yeah, yeah and, and uh cool. we'd do the timis call and and before the fight camp it would be to, to zero in and set an intention on what we want to accomplish and afterwards to heal and have reflection and to let go you know wow that's but, a cool uh, part of the the warrior uh experience there i've done one sweat lodge it was fantastic it is it's incredible it's even just just the sweat but at one yeah. point i asked him like hey man when are we going to do la medicina you know and he, <laughs> he started laughing and just said hey um i've been waiting for you to ask oh so we, we dropped in with uh psilocybin you know many times and and psilocybin in a sweat lodge yeah right before you go in so i mean you're you're in the sweat and by round four you're fucking balls deep you're tripping on mushrooms in the sweat lodge. Yep. That's so hardcore. It dude. is a, it is a, a, a wonderful combination of of powerful means in I either direction. I can't imagine you know? that cuz I I have been doing saunas for I know, since I was a little kid actually in hot springs. I'm used to hot and cold temperatures. I got that early on that it's good for you and all that. But in the sweat lodge I did, I was with a bunch of people. I don't think they were like that badass. And I mean, I almost couldn't hang. They're like, try not to leave. And I'm just like, oh my God, are you guys fucking kidding me? Like, how long is this? And I'm sitting there, I'm like crammed in against the fucking edge of the little tent thing. And it was brutal. I yeah, can't every imagine. Every time you hit it with the water, it just goes up to the top, which is right at your forehead level. And yeah, the face. it was super intense. So I can't imagine doing that tripping balls too. Yeah, those are powerful experiences. And that's wow. really, I had never, you know, like, like yourself, I had done shit inappropriately many times without an yeah. intention just uh let me escape yeah you take know? an acid at the kegger yeah and that was the <laughs> first time where i had an experience using plants in a constructive way to reveal what's going on inside and so much weight had been lifted and so much so many things could be worked through in that setting in that context and using them appropriately that it just turned me on to all of that and i found so much power in those things ayahuasca taught me to meditate and to do yoga like it was my message three ceremonies in a row and by the third ceremony i was like why the fuck do you keep telling me this and the answer was because you haven't started a daily wow. practice of yoga or meditation like you're not moving you're not going to graduate to the new information until you start to master this as you started getting into the plant medicines and exploring your consciousness meditating yoga all that you're still fighting you're still in the mma and all that yeah you know i i had done psilocybin probably started around 2010 ayahuasca in 2012 and uh ayahuasca is you know it's in a league of its own and how I, did you even find out about that shit coming from like the world that you did was it I through a, the the sweat lodge uh yeah, box yeah. You know, fight coach guy yeah and he he passed away but you know he really planted the seed for all of that and um yeah man you know it's like there's there's so much with that 
that I wouldn't have been exposed to in that way without him. So I owe, a, I have a huge debt of gratitude for him, you know, yeah. lots of love for him because he showed me that way. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's been a wild ride. I had a shoulder injury actually when I started ayahuasca. So there was time to take off from fighting and really dive deep okay. into the subconscious and see what's going on on the inside. And I only fought one time after that. By the time my shoulder had healed, I was training again. I wasn't sure I was going to fight again, you know, with the amount of money or lack of that fighters make and having a second job and living in my mom's garage. It, it started to not make sense anymore. Right. And, you know, taking health into consideration, if my face is getting hit hard enough to break, literally break, that's going to take its toll long term. Is that right. what happens? You can actually, you can get all the bones broken up in your face and shit? Yeah, I've had my left eyebrow and orbital bone fractured twice. I've had my <laughs> jaw busted in two places. Like, oh, fighting dude. a light heavyweight, you know, that's Chuck Liddell and Shogun Hua and John Jones. That's all, I've never fought those guys, but that's the yeah. fucking division. You know, you're, wow. you're, you're about as big as a heavyweight out of fight camp, then you cut down to 205 right. with all that power and speed. Yeah, it, it took its toll. That so. shit's crazy, dude. It's so interesting to... Uh, to just talk to someone who's explored that that part of their humanity in this journey you know because as i said for me i'm I always try to put myself in people's shoes like oh what would that be like to have that experience you know it's like dude i can't think of many things that i would dislike more than hopping in a fucking ring and having some huge guy hit me in the face even once <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> let alone multiple times for like a few minutes you know one blow i'm like yeah i'm career over i'm out bad idea you know it's just it's so interesting to uh to have gone on that journey but as you started to work with consciousness a bit and you start doing the math of you know this isn't really adding up i'm not you know not going to be buying a house on this salary anytime soon and shit you started to kind of fade out of you know, the dream of doing that professionally ongoing. Yeah. And it was less important, you know, with doing the work with ayahuasca and things like that. Like it just wasn't the most important thing in my life anymore. And it really has to be to be successful at that. Right. You know, but all along the way I had been, you know, fighting taught me to dive deep into health and wellness and nutrition, mobility, all the things that would help me in the fight game. It was a reason to learn more. And I've read more in fighting than I ever did in college or prior so i had a lot of knowledge there and then after retiring you know diving into cognitive optimization like what are the things i can do to help me heal the damage that i've done and do you ever uh, get a concussion oh fuck <laughs> you're like uh, a yeah, concussion yeah yeah uh many you know many no I, shit many, many signs of concussion um yeah i talked about that on a rogan experience when i fought glover Teixeira. uh he hit me so hard in the temple twice with left hooks that's the only fight where i forgot where the locker room was so when oh, i was leaving the cage dude. my coach had dipped out and i wandered through the halls aimlessly making small talk with anyone i bumped into because i didn't want to say i don't know where the locker room is because that would result in a longer suspension they would oh. say hey your head got fucked up you got to take eight months off or six months off instead of being able to fight again in two months Oh, so I didn't wow. tell the, I didn't tell anybody wow. and I just wandered around talking to people like, yeah, it was a shitty fight. Got my ass beat. You know, I was like, it's a fucked up deal, you know, and, and I didn't sleep well for three days. Um, definitely battled depression from that, which is a clear cut sign of concussion and uh, TBI. So it's, but these things are, they were the catalysts for me to learn about this stuff, to learn about yeah. how diet affects the brain, which supplements work, which nootropics work. How do we play with this stuff? How can I play with microdosing to help influence change? And you know, the beautiful thing that as science catches up to this stuff, that's a little bit more out there from breath work and cold therapy, biohacks to things like plant medicines, like DMT is incredibly healing for the brain. And in the oh, vine, is it really? yeah, man, in the vine, Banisteriopsis capi, which is one of the components, one of the, the biggest components of ayahuasca, they've found two alkaloids, harmine and harmaline that actually help create new neurons. So you, you're, you're essentially, it's like one of the greatest concoctions you can have for the brain. And it's uh, found it to be incredibly healing. Have you ever done any, uh, you know, like brain scans or anything like that before earlier in life versus now after having done a lot of these interventions no, they, and stuff? They do, it, they do it now for fighters with the Cleveland Clinic out in Vegas, which is kind of the, the home base of the UFC. And um, I've talked to a few guys that, that have participated in that. I feel, you know, I would, I would be curious to look at it now you know, to see like what has changed. Like, I obviously have nothing to compare it to, but what my brain looks like now having done all these interventions. But the truth is like we were talking about on the Onnit podcast, when you feel it, you understand that it's working, you know? And, yeah. and my memory recall works better than it ever did when I was a fucking kid right now. 
Right. Like I, and I even thought like once I went into ketosis, the way I was able to remember and recall things from books and the things I was reading and just fucking throw out numbers and understand and grasp the concept, I considered going back to school just because of that. And then realized like, no, nah, I think this stuff can be learned outside of school. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's funny as you, as you get older and your, your passions change. So you started losing the passion for fighting. You're like, what's the point? There's, there's more to life than this. And you're mm -hmm. going another direction. It's interesting how you can actually get a thirst for education. I've had that same thought. I'm like, I should go to business school. You know, I have two businesses. I don't know anything about fucking business other than just <laughs> trial and error. You know, if, but when I was a kid, if you're like, hey, you should go to business school, I'd be like, I'm playing in a band, dummy. Go to business school? I'm way too cool for that. So, <laughs> so you've been self-educating ever since that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happened after you... Like, what'd you do for work and shit like that when you were like, oh, I'm not going to fight. I mean, no, what kind I worked, of I worked did you the have? entire time I was in the UFC. Okay. I made 20 grand a fight if I won, 10 grand if I lost. Okay. The, for on average. Okay. So then you pay 10% to coaches, 10% to management. Then you pay the IRS off of your fucking 16 uh, grand. Because I'm like, that doesn't sound that bad. Shit. I might take a hit actually for 10 grand. <laughs> 10 grand? No, <laughs> fuck that, dude. <laughs> 100 grand, maybe, you know, not 10. I mean, I think about the shit I have to do to make 10 grand. It's a lot of work. There's, there's stuff, but I don't get bloodied or get broken, you know, eyebrows either. It's long-term stuff that you consider, you know, yeah. you have to. So I what's mean, a UFC fighter, you know, that's winning top of his game, one of the, you know, top 10 famous guys, what are they getting to fight? Well, Conor McGregor's making seven figures, you know, but Damn. he's, he's kind of he's kind of in a league of his own. Right. Um, you know, there's other guys that, that make around 300 grand a fight, that kind of thing. And the, the, those are champions, you know? Yeah. So it's, I mean, the pay scale, the pay scale to, in fighting is just atrocious. Like the NFL in 2007 went on strike, the players union did, because they wanted 55% of the total revenue. And they won and got it. It's understood now that fighters from any given fight card, even when Connor gets seven figures, the total revenue split for fighters as a whole is under 15%. Oh, wow. 85% of the owners. Damn. So it's a fucking different game. It's you know, pretty rigged. For work, I was bouncing and bartending at a titty bar the entire right. time i was in the ufc wow it was only like a six month stretch where i could train full time right. because of two fight of the night bonuses the second i lost again i was right back to work in the grind until 3 30 a.m wow god that's such like an unhealthy environment on so many levels too uh -huh. for someone that's doing a lot of physical exertion and needs to recover on so many levels yeah and just emotionally you know, yeah like i mean just like it's, it's yeah not... <laughs> it's it's funny like <laughs> I've done a lot of crazy shit. I have never liked strip clubs. I just, I walk in there and I'm like, these guys are suckers. You're getting fucking played. These girls don't like you. Yeah. And when I was like 18 and was allowed to go to them, I was like, this is dumb. Go meet a nice girl, take her on a date, spend half the money that you went in a strip club. Probably have better chances of getting laid at the end of it. I digress. So, so you work in there. And then at what point did you start to move into, you know, you're exploring health and wellness as we call it and you know you're becoming a psychonaut and all this shit but at what point did you start to do this kind of work professionally yeah it was um, a couple of years ago i went on joe rogan's show and um i know he tells this to fucking probably half the people he has on but he's like dude you need to start a podcast oh no way and i was like yeah i've, I've considered it but not really certain about it and he's like dude it's easy you know young jamie will help you get set up if you don't know the technical shit and um really wanted to do that and uh you know that was kind of the push and had a company come along that wanted to sponsor the podcast so i could do it full time and so started doing that um just last year you know had my own podcast and it was doing i mean well for a brand new podcast not taken off or anything like that and um came out to paleo fx met aubrey we shared the same flight home uh because they're open the next on it gym in vegas i was living in vegas and we hit it off. We talked plant medicines, diet, health, and wellness, just all the things. Yeah, you guys are like kindred spirits for sure. That's my brother. Yeah, that's for sure. funny. And uh, and I knew who Aubrey, I'd followed Aubrey for years on the Rogan yeah. show, and and already was balls deep with Alpha Brain and a lot of the Onnit products. Right. So he offered me a job. I was like, well, I kind of got a good thing here in Vegas. We got family, and um, as chance would have it, I was flying out for an interview, and in the airport, that company let me go without severance. So wow. it was like, oh shit, all right. And I fucking meditated the entire flight getting in just to fucking be calm and present. And I actually felt better when I got off the flight than when I did before the flight. 
like but with hearing the news not figuring out like where are we going to fucking live what are we going to do and uh it was awesome you know got hired here and it's been a pretty fast change of pace you know we moved twice last year a lot of stressors but um austin's a fucking beautiful place and um you know at first i thought i'd just be taking over the on it podcast and and really there i do so much more here that it's it's really fulfilling and there's there's a lot of novelty here you know it, it keeps shit fresh and and for having a a desk you know and a, a cubicle it's a pretty fucking cool place you know we get the infrared sauna dual and hot rock we can use on the clock you know where everyone here is encouraged to work out and to move a lot of times you'll see me outside grounding with my shirt off doing tai chi in the fucking grass and just experience you know i look like a fucking weirdo i'm kind of the the company guinea pig um but it's beautiful to have that freedom you know i'm rarely at my desk unless i actually have to bang out some emails or do some work but for the most part i get to experience what it means to be you know living the life of total human optimization on the way over here from my airbnb to the uh on at hq the uber driver and i were having a chat they're very chatty here which i'm not normally a fan of and I, I, I've had a, had the dis- discipline where I have to tell Uber drivers like, hey, like no offense, you seem like a great person, but I really just like some quiet time. And, and I'm like such a people pleaser, it's actually hard for me to do that, but I've learned. Mm. This girl started talking, I was about to be like, yeah, I already told her to turn the radio off. She's bumping some fucking techno when I got in, I'm like not having it. She starts talking, I'm like, hmm, is, how annoying is this gonna be? And then I thought, I could A, be a nice person and be friendly to her. <laughs> B, it'll get me in a good talkative state because I'm about to go record two podcasts. So she didn't know she was being used as a flow state and, um, you know, <laughs> instigator. <laughs> but what she said, she was like, I love driving Uber because I don't like having a job. And I said, you know what? I hate having a job too. I don't even have a job. I have companies, but I don't have a job. And then when I came in here on that thought, that's the last thing we talked about was how much jobs suck. And I walk in here, I'm looking at you guys. I'm like, dude, I was going to work anywhere this would be the spot meditation room gym sauna all kind of every kind of smoothie and superfood you could ever want good lighting acs bumping you got pmf you got a massage table i'm like if you're gonna have a job this is the place to have a job so just shout out to on it if you guys are hiring any of my listeners <laughs> you know i would definitely be on their human resources tip and like if you're gonna work anywhere this is probably the best place in the world so let's get into some of the other practices that you're into uh, i want to know about uh you know the kind of breath work you're into the cold plunges you know all the kind of stuff that you're doing um on the physical level yeah there's and, and also what your workouts look like now uh, not training to go kick someone's ass but working more on whatever you're working on bodily yeah those are much different you know i, I experiment with a lot of things and and keep what sticks right and certainly you know listen to wim hof on ferris and rogan's made a lot of sense to me i started hitting the breath work right in the car while i was listening and then all right no breath holes i'm fucking getting lightheaded <laughs> it, it, don't do what i did this morning to pass out <laughs> in the car for sure it works you know it really does work and um i probably spent thousands of dollars on ice over the years we had a horse trough that i got off amazon and um you're looking at 60 to 80 bucks every time you want to do an ice bath that shit adds up quick but uh, Kelly Sturette and Matt Vincent were telling me, like, buy a chest freezer. You would That's throw what I did. In. Yeah, dude. It's Dope. the best thing. I wanted to ask you about that because I yeah. heard you're using, like, hydrogen drops and all sorts of cool little add-ins. Yeah. All I've been doing is Epsom salt and uh, dead sea salt. But I want to mitigate growth of fungus, bacteria, and mold, whatever the fuck's going to grow in that thing. Yeah. We shower before we get in. But, you know, anything that can make the water last longer is also savings, you know? Yeah. So. Do you want to know the download real yes, quick? Yes, I want the download. Because I put together this protocol for Ben Greenfield because he got wind of my setup. And then, I don't know, I started making the email and it ended up being longer than just like, oh, yeah, buy the thing at Sears. I was like, God damn it, I can't do anything half ass. So I made this whole protocol with Amazon links and all this. And I think he's making a blog post about it. He is. This week comes up Tuesday. Oh, okay, cool. BenGreenfieldFitness.com. Cool. So I'll give Ben a shout out and you can find this protocol uh, there. And, you know, of course, I borrowed bits and pieces of it, pieces of it from other people. But um first thing I did is I bought the Sears freezer and you want at least 17 cubic feet, probably more for a guy your size. I mean, I got 22. Yeah, 22 is good. And then if you really wanted to, you could squeeze another person in there and you could sit feet to feet and Mm -hmm. then, you know, not that comfortably, but you could do it. But what I realized when I first got is I'd fill it up with water and I use a, a chlorine filter on the end of the hose that gets out some of the chemicals. It's probably not a great filter, but it's better than just raw dog tap water from LA water, which is highly toxic and disgusting. So I filtered the water, filled it up, but then I realized two things. A, 
if you just leave that shit on, it turns into a fucking iceberg. It does. You, you can't regulate the temperature. The dial does nothing. I mean, you put the dial on low and leave it on 24 hours and it'll be all frozen. So then I got a timer. Then I had to play with the timing. And in LA weather, about two hours a night keeps it between 40 and 45 degrees, which is kind of a sweet spot for me. Although I found out to get a CT effect, you actually don't need it that cold, which is good news because that shit's brutal. So the timer to regulate the temperature. Then one day I'm in there and I'm looking up at the sun. I'm going, oh, this is amazing, man. I'm in this cold water. I'm getting the sun exposure. This is so healthy. And then I realized I'm not grounded. No fucking body of water on the planet is ever not grounded unless it's a man-made thing where the water's suspended somewhere. I'm like, that can't be good. I don't know why scientifically, but it just it's not natural. So I got a, a copper grounding spike and put that into the dirt next to it. And then there's a wire going into mm. the tub with an alligator clip. So now I'm grounded. But here's the thing, depending on where you live, you got to make sure that you have a, um, a breaker on that wire because if lightning strikes the ground around your ass, you don't want to be sitting in that tub. The breaker is going to, it's going to break the seal mm -hmm. so that you're not grounded to the ground that now is full of electricity from the lightning. That's a really important part. And then the other part is to unplug it when you're in there. Just be on the safe side. You never know. You might fall through the bottom and the water goes into the fucking engine. You electrocute yourself. I don't know. It just seems safe to me. And then uh, another part of it is to, uh, I forgot this, this is before you fill it up to take clear silicone and do all of the creases around it because eventually it'll start to oxidize and rust a little bit where uh, there's cracks in the metal that it's made out of. Like okay. some of the paint will wear a little bit thin. Mm. So you silicone seal that to prevent the rust. And then for the disinfection, I don't know where I got this idea, but I just take a whole bottle of hydrogen peroxide, like the 3% stuff from Rite Aid or whatever, and I just empty a whole bottle in there every time I change the water. And it seems to... Uh, slow down the bacterial growth so that the water lasts like two or three weeks without getting swampy okay. and you'll know when it gets swampy because you get in there and when you open the lid you're like oh swamp ass yeah. <laughs> you know it's yeah. like yeah it's not especially if you don't shower like you said before you get in there uh the one that i have is at story fitness my brother's gym but really i'm the only one that really uses it everyone i know they haven't caught on to how dope it is and i think that's the whole protocol yeah awesome. and, you, and you can do all that for around six seven hundred bucks yeah and that's my my what i was getting at with the, like, the cost of ice yeah Once you dude, realize that's what how i used benefit, to do it's so it's such a benefit it's a fucking meditation hack you can't think about anything else what temperature do you do and for how long we go between 35 and 55 and so i'll plug it in for probably six hours some ice will float around yeah and uh we'll get in you know at 35 i'll do probably three to five minutes uh i've gone a little bit longer in the past but i don't find that to be necessary you know, and then probably in the 10 minute range or in the, when it's in the low forties and then 15, 20 minutes, you know, maybe 25 tops. When you say we, who else is getting in there? My wife. Oh, she's down with this stuff? Yeah, man. She's oh, getting, that's it's cool. A, it's the fucking move. You know, it's, it's one of that's the cool amazing. things that helps performance and longevity. You know, right. anytime we influence the mitochondria, we influence muscle function, how our body creates energy. And that also taps into cognitive energy. You know, do you, do you, do you go in there after you work out? Like after you lift? Most people would say that you'd want to have at least a two hour window before or after that kind of shit. Right. The truth of the matter is like Nick now, and that, that can segue us in because I know we're running out of time, but how I train now, it's way different. You know, I, I used to train two or three times a day, five days a week and have, you know, one, one Damn. easy workout and then a day off. And, um, a that's unsustainable, but B like, I don't need to be in that kind of shape. So why would yeah. I fucking do that? It's not fun um and plus i was a piece of shit in between my training you know i'm just dragging ass until i'm actually 30 minutes into a warm-up then i feel awake and alive and, and can move right so having a three-year-old that's not really conducive to, to being a good father if i show up and i can't play and i have to sit on the couch and sorry you know and how many how many fucking dads come home from work and have no energy for their kid it's a shitty situation right yeah. so when i show up i want to be the best version of myself and i've actually found that the cold bath is my late afternoon, early evening cup of coffee. Like I can't drink coffee at that point and have good sleep. But if I hit five minutes in the bath when I get home from work, I've got a fucking ton of energy for my son until he's ready to crash. And then I do sleep better. You know, so the timing of that has been essential for me. That's interesting. I never have really done it much in the afternoon like that. It's usually a morning thing, like after I work out. Yeah, everyone that, but that maybe I that's, I've heard, maybe that's why I don't have muscles because I'll go <laughs> work out and then stop the inflammation that would grow muscle. You know, yeah. I, that's one theory. I don't know if that's, that's true. the only reason you're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, I, you know, I, I might lift weights once or twice a week now. You right. know, and, and that's not, I would love to do it more often. I truly enjoy it. Like it, obviously you get a lot of endorphins and, and feel good chemistry going on every time you work out, but I don't really put myself through the grinder anymore. Like I have 30 yeah. to 45 minute workouts. Usually I'll, I'll try to pair that killing two birds with one stone with some sauna for 15 to 20 minutes right after. And there's a lot of good science that shows that can have an EPO like effect on the body. If you time it, cause your, your core temperature is already up. So you don't need to necessarily have to hit an hour. You can just tack 20 oh, minutes on yeah. the end of your workout. That's like the nice and uh, detox that I was doing. We didn't get into that <laughs> oh, on our shit, podcast. Dude. I want you to fucking That's drop right. knowledge on this. That's right. Oh, fuck, man. Well, it's your interview, so I don't, we'll have to do it another time. Okay. But it's it's the, for anyone that wants to look it up, it's, it's the L. Ron Hubbard original Scientology niacin sauna detox protocol. And it's- You might it's, start seeing aliens. You might start seeing aliens. Yeah, you might start watching a lot of Tom Cruise movies. There are a lot of known side effects. Uh, but essentially what you're doing is you just, you're taking increasing doses of niacin every day for uh, you know however, however long you choose to do it. I did it for a month uh, up to from 100 milligrams to 3,000 milligrams, which would like normally kill a horse, I think. But then what you're doing is you're exploding your fat cells, right? And you're releasing all these toxins and then you flush them out in the sauna and then take some binders and stuff like that. So you just take a shit ton of vitamins, you take the niacin, you work out, then you get in the sauna and it's it's not that hard. It's just the timing takes a little bit of discipline. But you, an easy way to find out about it, I mean, you can go on there. Uh, this guy Brett has a Facebook group, the niacin, I think it's called the niacin sauna detox group. And you can go on there and get tons of info if you, you know, if you guys want to put it in like your show notes from your show or whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, how'd you get your wife on board with the ice baths and the whole lifestyle? Was that like a, a tough buy-in or does she she's, naturally she's gravitate been toward it? on board reluctantly with all the things. Oh, you cool. Know? Um, she had never done any drugs growing up, never smoked pot. And her what? first ceremony was, <laughs> I, brought, I brought an ounce to my coach for the Tama's call. And it's something that, you know, I was telling her like, it's different. It's not about being high. It's spiritual. It's going to help us learn what's really going on inside and, and reveal yeah. a lot and um she was in so we went to uh the reservation and three of my teammates were supposed to come with us all of them backed out while we were driving out there so i had an ounce and i was like well we'll just take whatever he gives us and i'll give the rest as a thank you you know so dude literally pulls two fucking caps out and says thank you and starts splitting the rest of the bag into pairs and blessing it with sage and he has us eat each divided about 13 and a half grams for her oh my first experience. God, no way. And she's like, I mean, we're she's never chewing. smoked pot or anything. No. And there's, I mean, oh, dude. they weren't ground. It's not like we got to drink it. We had to right. chew through that much. They're and like nasty too. 20 minutes in and she's looking at him and she's like, is this a lot of mushrooms? I feel like we've been eating for a long time. And right. I didn't want to freak her out. And I was like, no, you know, whatever he's given us is, is the right dose. You know, like I'd have trust in him. He wouldn't give us more. You can't overdose. Like, we're going to be good. And we were. It was a fucking full moon ceremony. Absolutely incredible. And from that point on, that opened her up. You know, it was something. I like, bet, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she, she knew, like, there is power in this. Yeah. And um, when ayahuasca came along, she was like, I really don't want to shit my pants or puke violently for yeah. hours on end. So I'll let you go down the rabbit hole first. And if you can report about it back to me, then, then maybe I'll do it. And I couldn't talk about that experience for two weeks without just bursting into tears. That's how much it changed me. Wow. It was that deep, you know, and, and mushrooms I find to be now through working with ayahuasca, I can dose that in a way where it's just as powerful, but they're still their own thing. They really are. And um, that was the draw for her to want to do ayahuasca with me. And she's done, she's done it 12 times now. She's done 10 wow. of them with me. And, uh, you know a lot of growth through there i mean that revealed to me the way that i drank that revealed to me all the things that you hear from other people like i don't think you should drink i know you know what that's like and you're gonna and it's like well you're just a fucking nag maybe not maybe you can see something i can't you know and right. that, that revealed that to me and our relationship is so much better because of that you know so now when i say hey this is really going to help us with fat loss with longevity with whatever um she gets it you know right she that's that's pretty more. smart actually because if if you buy into the consciousness piece and have those aha clouds parting moments then it does tend to kind of open you up to other things i mean those are those transformative experiences that 
are the gateway to the rabbit hole. So yeah. well done, my friend. Yeah, lured her, her into ice baths and biohacks <laughs> yeah. through yeah, drug Yeah, that's, that's, that, <laughs> that actually makes a lot of sense. I, and, you know, I'm single at the moment, but I look forward to someday, hopefully, you know, you don't want a carbon copy of yourself, obviously, but it, it, I think it'd be cool to share those kind of experiences. I've not really had that um, prior where someone is on board with all the shit that I'm into, which is a little bit weird because I'm so into it. You know, it's hard yeah. to kind of, if you're if you're too separate and too different, then like, how the fuck do you spend time together? You yeah, know? you so. watch a movie that you may not like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. shit like that. She's so. pulled me. It goes both ways, you know. What she has got she me turned you on to? Distance running and no yoga. way. Yeah, she's doing yoga teacher training right now, and I've been helping her with that. Oh, cool. Jumping into home classes where her teacher has posted stuff online, and um, we'll do classes together. And and that, you know, anytime you go through experiences together that are lifting and ultimately make you more whole that's the shit that matters yeah you know, that's that's the sweet spot and i think the more things that you can do as a couple whether that's hiking or being in nature or you know going through ceremony like all those experiences bring you closer can i ask you something really personal and trippy mm -hmm. and obviously you don't have to answer you can just plead the fifth but have you guys had sex on ayahuasca you can't have sex on ayahuasca. oh you can't okay it's three not days, part of the tradition before, three days before ceremony <laughs> no sex three days after ceremony but that's we've had sex on mushrooms lsd right uh the other night we had lsd 2cb mdma and viagra it's the first time for that <laughs> it was fucking insanely good oh insanely my good. god bro yeah wow and i'm since she's on board with the lifestyle i'm sure she doesn't mind you talking about that that's that's fantastic wow man good for you i mean i can just imagine i think i asked that question what i'm really getting at is the level of intimacy that must be possible when you're going into those dimensions with someone that you love and trust you know yeah. And I think, I mean, there's a time and a place for that. You know, like like one of the reasons Terrence McKenna talks about how you would archetype the best heroic dose is to be alone or be with just one other person or a guide in a dark place that has instrumental music. So you're taking out all these external factors. You yeah. Know, that's how you do the work, right? Yeah. And so in when it's at its strongest, that's not the time you're having sex or yeah, chatting about the totally. experience. Given I pretty much knew the answer yeah. to that one. You're but give play by play, but certainly as it's sure. wearing off and you, you know, sure. you have closing circle and talk about your experience, like it's still in you and heightened awareness, heightened sensitivity and feeling and touch. Like what a great way to capitalize on that experience. Right. You know. That's cool. What are you gonna do when your kid's sixteen and starts doing plant journeys and shit with his homies? Uh, his first will probably be in the Amazon prior to the homies. Right. You okay. know, I want to teach him in a way where he understands the right way and the wrong way to do all these things. Yeah. You know? And certainly, um, not in a parking lot of a rap concert. Or yeah, something. man, he's going to hear all my stories. You know, my parents did a right. lot of this shit growing up and I never found out about it until I was like 20 or something. Really? You know? And so that's something where you don't want to leave that off the table. You know, you really need to know yeah. like, this will do this, this will do that. And I've gone down the rabbit hole on all of it. And if you want to experience it, that's fine, but let's do it in a controlled setting. Even if you want to get fucking drunk, let's experience that in a closed, in a controlled setting where you're not going to drive, you're not going to get hit, you're not going to get into a fight. And then you can feel what that does to your body the next day. Right. You know, and really being like Kelly Stratt talked about this with his daughters, not forcing them to never eat gluten, but maybe it can, it can hurt some people. It can be inflammatory. And then you know that once they understand that they go to a party as a seven-year-old eat cake and their t stomach hurts yeah and they shit weird and they're like all right next time i go i'm just gonna try the frosting and then even though that's pure sugar it didn't fuck them up the same way right right so you give them the knowledge and then let them make the choice for themselves because ultimately everyone does walk their own path but in this in doing that you at least show them why there's this cause and effect is happening you know you reminded me of something my dad did. God bless him. He's such a trickster. When I was a kid, I was he dipped, you know, he chewed skull. Like a lot of, you know, cowboys did in Colorado at the rodeos and shit. And I always thought that was dope. When I, I must have been like seven or eight. And I was always bugging him. Hey, can I try it? Can I try it? No, 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 you can't. It's for grownups. And uh, for some reason, I hadn't stolen it, you know, and tried it myself, which is bizarre. But one day he's like, you know what? We're on one of his construction sites and he was an excavator. And he said, you know what? You want to try it? Are you a man now? I said, yeah, I'm tough. Look at my cowboy boots, you know? <laughs> he said, all right. And he pulled out a big old fucking scoop of that, put it in my lip, and he did not tell me not to swallow. Ooh. And I'm sucking on that shit, swallowing the juice, and I got so, so sick that I didn't take that dip again for probably like six months. No, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, it didn't, you, you know, his circled back Yeah, his, no, his, his shit didn't work, but 
it was illustrating, you know, a similar principle that's like, hey, if you're going to do it, sure, do it with me and you'll find out what it's really about. But he was trying to trick me into not becoming a tobacco user, which failed miserably. <laughs> so so now that you're a dad and I'm like, God damn, I'm watching that clock and thinking about Austin International Airport. I'm, I'm good, though. I'm, I'm always kind of pushing the limits on the, my Jason Bourne way of traveling. So we'll be cool. I want to know just as someone who is not yet a dad and you not following the lead mostly that your parents taught you about parenting god bless them we've we've talked about that um how do you learn about like how to be a dad are you reading books or listening to like dad of the week podcast or paleo papas how do you how do you learn this shit intuitively there's or? a lot of books you know everyone's got a fucking book on how to parent everyone's got a book on children's nutrition i think you know nutritionally uh nourishing traditions of Baby and Child Care by Sally Fallon. She's head of the Weston A. Price Foundation. In oh, New York. that's a good place to start. Fucking great. Absolutely great. And certainly on the natural way to fix colds and fevers and shit that's going to come up because all kids get sick. That's been a real resource. Um, in terms of parenting style and how to discipline and all that, I mean, there's there's talks on all sides, you know, I think. But one of the best that we've read is uh, Positive Discipline. I forget the author. And then one that really grabs me is by Gabor Mate and another doctor. And Gabor is fucking just a wealth of knowledge and all badass. things. It's called Hold On to Your Kids. Oh, and they talk about wow. attachment. You know, when, when kids lose their attachment to their parents, everybody wants their kid to be independent and fucking go play with your friends and do all this other shit. So it's hands off because it's a lot of work. But the truth is you want that attachment to stay until they're fucking out of the house, until they go to college. You want them to be attached to you because they listen. People wonder why kids don't listen now and why discipline doesn't work or fill in the fucking blank. It's because they don't respect their fucking parents anymore. You know, so you create that attachment through six different methods. One of them is touch and play. And truly, by having that, that's when they want to follow the lead. That's when they say, can I do this, daddy? Or yes or no. And then they, they pay attention. It's not just to have a fucking robot there. You're still going to have Kids will be kids. They're going to push right. the fucking envelope and try to explore what they can get away with. That's totally normal. Yeah. Um, but that's been an excellent resource. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense in the context of uh, Gabor's work with addiction, which a lot of mm -hmm. his stuff is um, centered around in that it's all coming from trauma. And I kind of got that. I was like, oh, I was abused and this and that. But his concept of trauma is wide reaching. A lot of the trauma that he talks about, and correct me if I'm wrong, or you maybe can add to it, is that lack of connection, that lack of love is sort of this like reverse trauma in a sense. Like no one did anything to you. It's what they didn't do that was the trauma, which yeah. leads to so many. You There's know, science I reference like quite that. a bit where kids who were beat by their parents felt more love than, than the rich dad who never showed up. The guy who let wow. the nanny raise the kid who was always off on vacations with his wife or his mistress and just wasn't there. Did never discipline him, never grounded him, never did anything, just didn't give a fuck. Like that science is real and it makes perfect sense when you understand it and look at it that way. Like the right. parents who beat their kids or disciplining their kids, they care about their actions and it may not be the right way to go about it, but they're at least showing that they love them in some way, wow. wrong way or not. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow, cool, man. Well, I, I look forward to watching you and, and your kid's journey and seeing how that turns out. Do you think you're going to put him in public school? You have any, I mean, I know he's only three, but where, you, where are you him, leaning on the home school? If we put him in school, versus... I'm thinking Waldorf uh I like, they have that out here yeah i like oh, cool. i like rudolph steiner quite a bit yeah. um uh my wife was homeschooled so that's a consideration it's just a lot of work you know and i think yeah. it would be nice to take to give her a break especially with how much i travel now for work and things like that right it's a lot to ask right so you know and, considering waldorf and other schools but uh you know we were about a year away from preschool two years away so we'll see I got to ask this, and this is a, you know, maybe a weird closing question because it's so loaded, but I just did an episode uh, with this guy, Del Bigtree, on vaccines. And a lot of people think he's an anti-vaccine guy, but he's just, from what he explained in the show, and he made a lot of sense, he's a pro-research for safety guy. Like, let's actually do some research and not just throw this shit out on the market and inject kids with 75 vaccines by the time they're five or whatever. Was that a concern with you? How are you guys dealing with that? I think spacing is really important, you know, and I think that some vaccines kids need, some maybe not so much, you know, and we see now with just same thing with the pharmaceutical industry, like, oh, you got restless leg syndrome, you know, maybe it's, maybe you take this pill instead of why do you fucking have that in the first place? Right. Right. We're treating the symptom, not the source. And I think a lot of vaccines, they'll create a vaccine for everything. They really will. So 
what are the core ones that we need? How do we space those appropriately so they don't have the load of fucking mer- mercury, rethyl mercury, or whatever the fuck they're changing it up to, thymerosol, that kind of shit. Right. And because um, if, if, why do they not give it to cancer patients or, or people with HIV? Because they can fucking die from it. They're immunocompromised. Well, a newborn is compromised, they're not fully developed yet. Yeah, so they're just building their immune system their from shit, day one. That shit in their body right out of the gate, it can be a real issue. And I think spacing at the very bare minimum is crucial. You know, yeah. and I think more investigation needs to be done into that. Um, I'm not, you know, anti or anything like that. I think that there's, you know, there, there certainly was a time and a place for them when we were sick as a society and had less sanitation. Um, I don't know. I don't like where it's heading. It's a thirty billion dollar a year industry. You know, there's a lot of money on the table. And anytime you force people to do shit, you know, then without consequence, we see how that science leads the way. It pushes the way. This is safe. Look at fucking glyphosate from Monsanto. Yeah, it's money that gets it into the food supply. Aspartame as a fucking artificial sweetener is a neurotoxin. Money is why it's in the food supply. Our government doesn't give a flying fuck about us. Uh, right. That's not a conspiracy theory. Money talks. Right. So. Yeah. I think if people do their research and understand w- which things are necessary, and they talk about that in the book, Nourishing Traditions, Book of Child and Baby Care, um, you can at least have a better idea and understanding of what you feel is important and when the timing's right, and then take it from there. How are the laws in Texas as far as that goes? It's a little bit better. Uh, California just recently switched. Like you, you can't put your kid in public school. There's no, there's no medical uh, grants, I don't think, anymore. You definitely can't do religious or spiritual uh exemptions yeah here is different you know they're pretty right wing but they also believe in you know we should have a choice over what we put in our kids bodies so right. exemptions are are utilized here again this is that's that's a couple years down the road yeah. for when we got to look at that yeah but, yeah i guess that's the the advantage of having a more conservative state government in texas mm-hmm. I, I think that's what's cool kind of about austin is you have like a conservative state government but a kind of liberal culture it's interesting mm-hmm. just from my you know four or five days i've been here or whatever it's been it's, it's pretty cool uh well man i think that about does it dude you've taught me a ton of stuff today it's really interesting getting to know you and thanks so much for having me on your show too by the way uh in closing who have been three teachers or teachings that you might send our listeners to go check out that have influenced you and your life and your work Ooh, that's a good one uh let me go First and foremost, I'll throw a plug to my boy, Aubrey, who just released On the Day, On Your Life. Great book. It is a fucking phenomenal book. I read it several times. Um, I think it's a great place for people to start to really try to put together what the perfect day looks like. And there's many practices that I've taken out of that book that work really well. Um, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, which I'm sure you mentioned a ton of times, is just, it's a book. It's the the book that I've read the most out of any book. I've read it probably 11 or 12 times. And I still pick up things from it as I rehash that. You know, I'll probably read it once a year now and continue to learn from it. You know, it's been an excellent resource. Um, man, I don't know necessarily that I'd have a third for a person. <laughs> That's funny. The last guest that I interviewed, they got two and they were like, yeah, I don't know. Three I can't do. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I, I could list like no, I know. any any one particular thing like, yeah, you want the keto, the keto reset diet by Mark Sisson. Right. You're going to eat carbs. You want to know the best way to do that? Wired to eat by Rob Wolf. You want this? I think I got this for you. That kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. But as far as like truly impactful things, that's probably those are the top. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Game. And where can people find you? Website, social media, all that stuff. At Kingsboo on Twitter and Instagram. Don't really go on Facebook much. Um, at On It on all the social media channels. I run uh, Facebook Lives every other week through their channel on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. On It Podcast and then on it.com. Awesome, dude. Thanks for joining me. I got to get to the goddamn airport. Let's do it, brother. I'll see you next time. Hell yeah. Yeah.